Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, How to Interpret Scripture. Now that should be a good skill for everybody to attain. This particular lesson is lesson number 12 for June 20 of 2020, entitled, Dealing with Difficult Passages. Hmm. That should be a bit of a, may, may be a bit of a challenge, we'll see. We always begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, now as we turn once again to our study of the Bible and how to correctly interpret it and understand it, help us to see light and how to deal with some difficult passages. We know that you intended for everything in Scripture to be plain, so may that be the case for us today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Already in the days of Peter and Paul, there were some things which were, quote, and I'm quoting 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So beware. It was starting right back there in the beginning. Well, there are three important things to notice in this brief statement. One, Peter already considered Paul's writings to be a part of the scriptures. Two, already untaught and unstable people were twisting what Paul had said to their own destruction. And three, only some things are difficult to understand, not all things. Therefore, this week we will take a look at approaches we should take to a, a apparently difficult text. One of the most common reasons, and I hope nobody takes offense at this, that ordinary people have difficulty understanding some passages of Scripture is the use of the traditional King James Version. In that case, the problem is the use of ancient language with which many people are not familiar in our day. People need to move to the new King James Version or some more up-to-date version to avoid that difficulty. Of course, for those who are already familiar with the language of the King James Version, it is fine. Now, you might say, well, why do we need to go to a modern version? The Bible was written in a modern language in its day. Why shouldn't we be using modern language in our day? Also, was a, at the time the King James was put together, it was about 100 years out of date. Yeah. Because, you know, from the time Tyndale started in 1525, yeah. mm -hmm. then it was 1611, and now here we're dealing with a language that's 400 years even farther out of date. Of course, what the people who read the King James don't realize is they're not reading the King James, really. They're reading, a, what, the fifth or sixth update? 1769 was the most. And then there was an 1881. That, well, that's an RSV, or it can be a revised version of 1881. I like the sound of it. Well, yeah, oh, it's yeah. because what, it's what you're familiar with the hearing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, quick question. There are how many approximately translations of the scriptures? Oh, I'm in what language? There. No, no, just in, English? in English. Just yeah. Just I, English. What I'm saying is, they're going from Greek and Hebrew, and they're translating. The reason why I'm asking is, I, I've been I'm told that there are folk who are translating these uh, scriptures. Some of them don't even believe in the deity of Christ. Mm. Oh, sure. Oh yeah, there's, there's uh, Jim has, and I have a copy that's uh, the New Testament as uh, translated by the corrected by the spirits, by the spirits. corrected spirits. corrected by the spirits. Right. You want to read a really fun one? <laughs> yeah, J J J in some translations, John, chapter five, verse thirty-nine. No, John five verses seven and eight. That was put in there by Roman Catholic bishops. No, no, no. First John 5. 39. Seven. I know, oh, I understand. Oh, oh. Uh, the First Trinity. John 5, 7. No, uh, John 5, 39 says, oh. you search the scriptures, fall in them, you think you have eternal life. They're the very ones that point Talk to me. And you go through, there are, I, I don't remember the ones, but I have watched this, you know, and you go there in their Bible, it's not there. Mm -hmm. Because they don't, some of yeah. these folk who are translating don't even believe in the deity of Christ. So we just have to be careful, that's all. Yeah, that's that, the New World Translation is big on that. There's, well, another problem you got is uh, Romans 3.25. Oh, yeah. Most of the, most translations are 
have a phrase uh, in there that shouldn't even be in there. It's just yeah. purely made up. Yeah. And uh, this idea of propitiation, uh, and uh, that wasn't, I think, uh, about 1568 is the first time it entered into the English uh, translation. And it was just a, a passage uh, uh, made up based upon the presupposition on the part of the translators. Yeah. You see, that's a problem with, I, as an, another example would be um, the, the general editor of this is um, uh, Dr. Bruce Metzger. And some years ago, I was back at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary uh, with the Bible Collectors Convention. Anyway, he was going to explain how Bible translators do their work. And he chose uh, John twelve thirty two. Mm. I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto myself. They put in the King James, they put in the word men. And most translations now today say uh, men, uh, men or everyone and so on and forth. But it just says, I will draw all unto myself. Mm -hmm. Now you've got the universe wide picture. Yeah. But with, with Gene, with just uh, uh, that, when you make a change like that, you can distort the meaning. <clears throat> What I was going to say is you make mention of this further along. We're still ahead of the game. You've got to compare stuff. You've got yeah. to do a little spade work to find out here and there. Yeah. The safest thing, if you run to something that looks a little suspicious, compare another version. Well, then also remember, uh, what is it, uh, Matthew 23, starting in verse 13 and following, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Really? Now, who's left out of that bunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's seven times Jesus said yeah, yeah. enough right, time right. to be made. Right. Then you go to back to Jeremiah eight, verse eight. The scribes say, Oh, we've got the law, but their lying pen has made it into a lie. Yeah. Now put that in, into your equation. Yeah. But anyone who has spent time with Scripture and has struggled to understand all that is written there will re recognize that there are some difficult passages. We should not find this surprising at all. An infinite God used ordinary people in ancient times and cultures which we do not fully understand to instruct us living in the 21st century about his infinite character and government. We should be amazed that the Bible is as clear as it is. But let us admit that those who want to destroy trust in the Bible will find difficulties in apparent contradictions and errors. Some of those errors might be a result not of the original documents, but of copyists or translators down through the generations. Ellen White had a comment about that, Jim. Some look to us gravely and say, don't you think there might be, excuse me, might have been some mistake in the copyists in the translators? This is all probable, and the mind that is so narrow that it will hesitate and stumble over every possibility or probability should be just as ready to stumble over the mysteries of the inspired word because the feeble minds cannot see through the purposes of God. Yes, they would just as easily stumble over plain facts, excuse me, over plain facts that the common mind will accept and discern the divine to be which God's utterance, utterance is plain and beautiful, full of marrow and fatness. All the mistakes will not cause trouble to one soul or cause any feet to stumble that would not manufacture difficulties from the plainest revealed truth. Second message, book one, Ellen White. Well, such difficulties need not trouble the student who takes all of Scripture and compares Scripture with Scripture, always taking it in the spirit of humility and submission. Any one of us who has, who has confronted or perhaps even lived among people with a different culture and language should immediately recognize these challenges. So-called scholars who do not believe in the divine inspiration of Scripture simply assume that apparent contradiction mistakes are there because the Bible is only a human document. Well, Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the inspiration of all 66 books of the Bible must believe that God has done whatever is necessary to preserve his word until our, until our day in a form and with a meaning that correctly represents him. If he has not, then he will forgive us for misunderstanding. So if, if the word hasn't been preserved well enough for our day, then there's nothing, we, we can't go back and redo history. So, but I believe absolutely that God has preserved the, God, this, the Bible just incredibly 
well. I, I, don't, I think there's very few errors compared to the way it was originally written. Studying uh, some other religions. Um, we have been given a beautiful picture of the plan of salvation mm -hmm. that starts Ezekiel chapter 28, right there, mm -hmm. right in heaven. Yep. And, and how the Lord is leading his people through and that his name is vindicated at last. This is beautiful. So why go on to something and then say, I, this is not believable. Yeah. When we look at the beautiful big picture, it really everything fits together yeah. so well. As we read, we, we need to recognize that Bible writers used non-technical, ordinary, everyday language. I mean, these are the languages, the Bible is written in the languages where you would go to the market and buy some potatoes. I mean, this is not some scholarly language from somewhere. Sometimes they used idioms that we are not familiar with. Maybe these statements are imprecise, but they are not, not untruthful. Kerry? Some discrepancies might be due to minor variations and errors caused by copyists and translators of the Bible. Most of those transmissional errors are unintentional changes, where copyists confuse similar letters or, when copying a text, the copyist accidentally skips ahead to another word or line with the same word or letter. Let me, let me interrupt there for a second. Yes. You can see how easy that would be if you're, you're reading along there and you're, you're, and you're you, but remember, they're, they're having to look at it or, or sometimes listen to it and then copy it down. Just you look at here and you copy down, you look up here and you copy down here. It's so easy if you've got two, set, two lines with the same word, maybe a little ways apart, to jump, so that's what they're talking about. This tendency is compounded where, no, when rather, there are no spaces between words or punctuation marks, which certainly was the case for Greek texts and may have been true of Hebrew as well. That comes from a student's guide to textual criticism of the Bible uh, by Paul D. Wegner. Sometimes a reversal in the order of the two letters or words occurs, for example, in John 1.42, the name John, Anu, as found in several manuscripts, is read Jonah, Iona, in some other manuscripts. See Wagner, A Student's Guide to Textual Criticism of the Bible. Uh, for this and other examples, such problems should not distress us. First of all, the biblical manuscripts are by far the most reliable and best preserved manuscripts of the ancient world. No other literature is transmitted in so many manuscripts and is copied so meticulously in reference to the original composition as are the biblical manuscripts. Second, those minor changes can be corrected in light of the other evidence that is available. Mm -hmm. They do not affect any major doctrine or teaching of the Bible. While copyists and translators generally have been extremely careful in their work, they were not inspired as were the original biblical authors. Ellen G. White was aware that their quote, might have been some mistakes in the copyist or in the translators, unquote. But for her, all those mistakes, quote, will not cause trouble to one soul or cause any feet to stumble that would not manufacture difficulties from the plainest reveal truth, quote, Ellen G. White, Manuscript 16, 1888. Very good. Well, when reading the Bible and interpreting it for ourselves, we must be honest and careful. We must not brush over difficulties pretending like they do not, do not exist. So how can we be sure that the answers that we believe or teach are correct? Do they correspond with other scriptures? Are they supported by the writings of Ellen White? Do they make sense? Charles? God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to bear our faith. To base our faith. Base our faith. His ex existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appears, appeals to our reason. 
and this is testimony is abundant yet god has moved never removed the possibility of doubt our faith must rest upon evidence not demonstration those who wish to doubt will have opportunity while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence upon which to rest their faith Ellen White steps to Christ page 105 that's a very very interesting and challenging god never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence of which upon which to base our faith his existence yes. his character the truthfulness of his word now we have you know is set down in our in our doctrines these are truths one two three i mean we go down we 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 have a whole lot of stuff about those points god says you know look at it take it check it out there's plenty of evidence you don't have to be guessing one thing god doesn't what i've learned is he doesn't overwhelm us yeah. by making claims and pummel us into submission i would use the book of job here you got the, about half the book is 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 liars because mm -hmm. and you but you don't find that out until you get to chapter 42 verses 7 and 8 yeah. okay and it doesn't tell you what the lies are mm -hmm. but a couple of years ago i went through uh, based upon uh, what it was rattling around in my brain about what ken hart's uh, wife did uh, about 25 years ago yeah. And since when, when do we quote the words of, a, of an apparition mm -hmm. as a memory verse? It was in the, the Bible study guide that quote the words of an apparition. They quote El, uh, Eliphaz as, as, as if he has some truth to say. Well, the problem is Eliphaz, Bildad, Elihu, and uh, Zophar. Zophar are referred to as, as telling lies about God. But it right. doesn't tell you what the lies are. You have to go through... And what I did was go through with the with the um, ESORD program, right. and and lo and behold, these these things jump out. And the and the, the lies are, God punishes, right. God destroys. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it doesn't spell. You have to go search it out. But why is that? Why didn't it just play? No, I don't do these things. No, you have to. You need to see the contrast, mm -hmm. yeah. and it helps you develop discernment. Yeah, and that's why I. Uh, I Conclusion. If we if we do not have an immediately satisfactory answer for some Bible difficulty, it is better to be honest about it and wait until we understand it better. Being honest builds trust, especially when dealing with those whom we are trying to instruct or who are unfamiliar with our beliefs. How do we deal with passages that seem to disagree with our favorite theories? Often the difficulty with troublesome passages that they clearly teach things that we do not want to believe or accept. Hmm, that's a terrible idea. Are we willing to adjust our thinking to be in accordance with truth as seen in the Bible? Or are we trying to adjust our teachings of the Bible to agree with our thinking? Uh -huh. Disguise it, and this is steps to Christ again, disguise it as they may, the real cause of doubt and skepticism in most cases is the love of sin. Yeah. Hmm. Teachings and restrictions of God's word are not welcome to the proud, sin-loving heart. And those who are unwilling to obey its requirements are ready to doubt its authority. In order to arrive at truth, we must have a sincere desire to know the truth and a willingness of heart to obey it. Steps to Christ, 111, paragraph 1. So how should we deal with passages that we do not fully understand and which do not seem to fit with our understanding of truth? Are we willing to really study difficult passages to determine exactly what they teach and then accept that truth? I will tell you that I was trained as a pastor when I was in college. Then I went to medicine, and here I got uh, acquainted with Dr. Graham Maxwell, and I had several classes with him. And all of a sudden, passages I had no, even though I had full training as a pastor, I had never figured out what in the world those were talking about. And all of a sudden, Oh, obviously that's what it means. Like a light goes on. Yeah, like a light goes on. Well, James 4, 6 through 10 says, But the grace that God gives us is even stronger. And the scripture says, God resists the proud and but gives grace to the humble. So then, submit to God. Resist the devil. He will run away from you. 
Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. There's your hypocrites, Jim. Mm -hmm. Be sorrowful, cry and weep. Change your laughter into crying, your joy, your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And other passage, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and Zephaniah 3, 12. So how are we supposed to come to the Lord? Should we be consulting the pastor and let him do the interpretation for us? Or some Bible scholar? What about consulting a commentary? Or in some cases, a Bible dictionary? Maybe even a different, different translation. All those things are, are valid possible sources. We need, to, we need to look at the whole picture. The idea is that the bigger picture you got, the less likely it is to be an error. I'll tell you what I do. I go here. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what's there. And then different thoughts. You mm -hmm. see, then you, you help put it together. Yeah. I mean... Different translations are one of the best way, and nowadays with, with yes, cell phones, there you are right. You, you can. Uh, yes, uh, yep. it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Then you can put the picture together. But every, you, you need pixels. to keep reading because yep. just because you come up with a solution one place, you keep on, and then you see that same word from the Hebrew or the Greek, and it's used differently. Now you maybe go back and you learn something there, and go back and re and re yep. remodel it. It uh, never ends. Have any of us ever come to the amazing realization, which is quite humbling, that there is some new insight in Scripture of which you were unaware? Hmm, amazing. Don't we all see through a glass darkly, 1 Corinthians 13, 12? Being humble and willing to admit that we might be wrong does not mean that we do not have firm convictions. But are we submissive to biblical truth, Jim? Nothing frightens me more than to see the spirit of variance manifested by our brethren. We are on dangerous ground when we cannot meet together like Christians and courteously examine controversial points. Mm. I feel like fleeing from the place, from the place la Less. lest I <laughs> receive the mold of those who cannot candidly investigate the doctrines of the Bible. Those who cannot impartially examine the evidences of a position that differs from, their, from theirs are not fit to teach in any department of God's cause. Whoa, <laughs> how about that? Yes. You can think of a lot of people, that, yes. <laughs> especially in positions, None of, us, of, course. positions not, not, of authority. Not here. No, no, no. <laughs> Go ahead. What we need to, what's going to be, what we need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Without this, we are not more, no more. no more fitted to go forth to the world than were the disciples after the crucifixion of their, of their Lord Jesus, than their destitution, and told Jesus that. Knew. Excuse me. Jesus knew their destitution. Jesus knew their destitution, and told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they should be endowed with the power from on high. Every teacher must be learned, must be a learner, that is that his eyes may be anointed to see the evidences, evidences of the advancing truth of God. The beams of the Son of Righteousness must shine into their own heart if he should impart light to others. Ellen White, Review and Herald, February 18, 1890. And it's interesting to notice that this was written very shortly yes, after all those disagreements at the 1888, 1888 General Conference. Yeah. We need to humble our hearts and with sincerity and reverence search the word of life, for, the, for that mind alone is this humble and contrite, that, for, for that, that mind, mind alone that is, is that is humble and contrite can see light. Ellen White, Review and Herald, December 15, 1896. And elsewhere. Can we be both humble and certain at the same time? For example, how do we respond to people who ask us why we keep the Sabbath? Our first answer should be, look at all the evidence in Scripture. In the case of Sabbath observance, there is not a single passage in Scripture that supports Sunday sacredness. Carrie? Uh, yes, I'm just looking here. We got a little astray there a minute ago. Often we assume that no, if we... Those who desire... Okay, sorry. 
He got mine, I've got his now. Oh, okay. Those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. God does not propose to remove all occasion for unbelief. He gives evidence which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit, and all should decide from the weight of evidence. The weight of evidence. That's yeah. from Testimonies for the <coughs> Church from Ellen White. <coughs> Often we assume that if we cannot figure out the answer to something, it must not have an answer. Consider the case of someone first learning about algebra. Because they cannot figure out the answer after a brief attempt does not mean that there is no possible solution to the problem. The same is true for study of the Bible. That, is a, that, that paragraph says a great deal to me because I've always been fairly good at math. And when I was in high school, I was in boarding academy, Adventist Academy, we, there were four floors in our dormitory, and I was on the third floor. And it seemed like everybody in that whole floor needed to come. Every time, that, every night, we would have problems to work out in algebra. And my brother and I were rooming together. We seemed to be the only ones who could figure it out. And so all the whole team was down there. How do you solve this algebra problem? So that speaks to me. Sometimes it is appropriate to set a problem aside for a while and come back and look at it again later. It is appropriate also to consider what others have said about the passage. Remember that if the scriptures are going to be our only safety in the time of the end, shouldn't we be studying them diligently every day? Hmm. The Bible should never be studied without prayer. When we humbly pray to God to give us guidance, amazing insights are sometimes revealed, and I... I find when I'm, when I'm running in the morning, I run and while I'm listening to the Bible or maybe something from Ellen White, God gives me, I don't know whether it's because there's extra blood flowing to my brain or what, I get all kinds of wonderful insights. But we need to remember that the first place to look for answers to Bible difficulties is in the Bible itself. Yes. To apply ideas and scientific notions and philosophies from the 21st century to the Bible simply means we're trying to twist it. Try to remind yourself about the surroundings and the conditions in which the Bible writer was working. Always look at the difficult passages in light of the clear passages and not vice versa. So, I mean, that should be an obvious thing. I don't know why, some, but sometimes we do just the opposite. Taking an attitude of prayer towards Scripture always gives us a fresh perspective. Don't we recognize that we need God's help in understanding what we are reading? Are we honest in revealing to God our motives when trying to understand a passage? Does God understand the passage? Of course. Is he willing to guide us through the use of his Holy Spirit to discover the truth? Maybe not right now, but eventually yes. God doesn't have to give us all the information about every passage right now. Maybe it's not... Uh, for those of who have looked carefully or studied carefully the writings of Ellen White and her personal comments about them, know that sometimes she'd be given a vision and then she'd be told, don't, don't tell anybody right now. Wait, you'll, they'll, they'll be right. And then maybe sometimes a year later, oh, now it's time to write about. Why does God do that? I don't know, but obviously he had a reason. And, of course, there are times, some amazing times, like when she was down in Australia... And she would be, be given a message. She would write it out, quickly put it in the mail, and it would arrive back in America weeks later, just at the time a meeting was, was being held. And she had seen the meeting six weeks before and written about it. Old and there they are. Huh? Old Mail in was by boat, strictly. Yep. By, uh, by boat. And then the story of the, of the passage that end up in selective messages. It wasn't until 50 years later that, yeah. that they opened the, the, uh, the vaults. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience of suddenly realizing the answer to some perplexing problem with, with which you have been struggling? Is it the Holy Spirit that gives such answers? Well, remember the passages that we discussed back on earlier about God never asks us to believe without giving what? Sufficient evidence. evidence upon which to base our faith. Hmm. One of the challenges that troubles a lot of people is God's command for the children of Israel when entering the land of Canaan 
to destroy everyone. Such people have not looked carefully at the evidence. Why do I say that? Well, look at this. Go back to God's original command. This is right after he gave them the commandments from Mount Sinai. They're still camped down there. They're in the business of trying to, put, to build the, 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 the tabernacle and so forth. And God gives this message to Moses. I will send an angel ahead of you to protect you as you travel and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Pay attention to him and obey him. Do not rebel against him, for I have sent him, and he will not pardon such rebellion. Now, if we go over to the New Testament, what does Jesus say? Who was the one that was their angel? He himself. Jesus himself. So that A should have been capitalized. Mm -hmm. But if you obey him and do everything I command, I will fight against all. Who's going to fight? I will I, fight against all I, your enemies. My angel will go ahead of you and take you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and I will destroy them. Now, it doesn't really actually say destroy them. It could be that they will be destroyed or their religion will be yeah. of no effect, become of no effect. They will, they will not be a groups of people re recognized as groups of people. Yeah. And so he goes on to explain, do not bow down to their gods or worship them and do not adopt their religious practices. What's the whole purpose for this thing? Don't adopt their religious practices. Destroy their gods. Break down their sacred stone pillars. If you worship me, the Lord your God, I will bless you with food and water and take away all your illnesses in your land. No woman will have a miscarriage or to be without children. I will give you long lives. In, in fact, I think somewhere it says, I'll send hornets. Yeah. That's it. Was it Joshua? It, it, well, I, yes. uh, no, here, I, it, I'll read on to it where it has that. Surely. I will, reading verse 27, I will make the people who oppose you afraid of me. I will bring confusion among the people against whom you fight. I will make all your enemies turn and run from you. I will throw your enemies into a panic, my version here says, but that's where it says, I will send hornets. I will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites as you advance. And some of you are probably aware, if you're up with the news, that there's a new breed of hornets that have right. just... just we call it murder hornets. Washington. Yeah, yeah, invaded Washington that are, what, three three or four times as big as a regular bee. About two inches long or so. Yeah. Wow. That I wondered would, what they're That would put from. you in a... Really? It's but, but, as quarter of an inch long, I heard. Yeah. Really. I will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites as you advance. I would not drive them out within one year. If I did, the land would become desolate, Deserted, I'm sorry, and the wild animals would be too many for you. Instead, I will drive them out little by little until there are enough of you to take possession of the land. I will make the borders of your land extend from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will give you power over the inhabitants of the land and you will drive them out as you advance. See, the, the, the biggest problem was, it says, have nothing to do with them. Um, these are the folk who left the Lord and and says you, they are going to be a trap to you. Yes. What happens? The Lord gives the Ten Commandments. They says, Aaron, don't know what happened to Moses. Yep. Build us a calf. Right there, it's yeah. happening. Well, that what I just read for you from Exodus 23 was God's original plan. He was going to do something. By the way, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll discover that every time they followed God's directions to go into battle. They won. Yeah, they won. No, hands down. Sometimes they, they came back, they hadn't lost a single soldier. And every time they went on their own against God's direction, they, got defeated. they had a terrible defeat. You know, after a while you think, hmm, let's see, is there something going on here? Is there some kind of a pattern here? Well, unfortunately, listen to this. When the children of Israel were to enter the land of Canaan, they were to allow God to scatter the inhabitants ahead of them. Then they were to represent to represent God clearly and well enough so that some of those former inhabitants would be drawn to worship the true God. Mm -hmm. That was God's plan. But the children of Israel were not happy with that approach. They wanted to conquer their enemies with their swords and their spears so that they would get the credit for conquering. So the Lord says, I will drive them out. Right. Drive them out, not kill them. Yeah. Well, hold on. So, 
wait, we're, we're, we're going on. So they were not willing to let God do it for them. So finally, God effectively said, okay, do it your way. And so now we get these verses that people panic about. But when you capture cities in the land that the Lord your God has given you, kill everyone. Completely destroy all the people. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites. That's the same people as the Lord ordered you to do. Kill them so that they will not make you sin against the Lord by teaching you to do all the disgusting things that they do in worship of their gods. I mean, this is, you know, just, it, it made it very clear exactly why, how they were supposed to be done and so forth. And why did God tell them that? God said that it was, quote, so that they will not make you sin against the Lord by teaching you to do all those disgusting things that they do in the worship of their gods. I mean, these are these are people that were related to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. So God's purpose in both of those commands was to destroy the false forms of worship that permeated the land of Canaan. He knew that if the children of Israel allowed those people to continue worshiping their false fertility cult religions, the children of Israel would be attracted to them and eventually they would be overcome by them. And that is exactly what happened. Mm. Because they didn't get rid of them all. They were living among them. Often the New Testament will give explanations of things in the Old Testament that are much more consistent with what we believe were God's original intentions. Consider the Sermon on the Mount. And these are the contrast between the Old and the New. And I don't need to tell any of you, and I hope none of you out there, you know, Jesus would say, you, you, you were told, but I say. You were told, but I say. Now, does that mean that, they're in, that these Old Testament ideas and the New Testament ideas were in, were in contradiction? No. What was he saying? Let me expand what it says and make it more clear what, what, was, what was in the Old Testament. That's, that's the idea. Because those were really his words. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, we must also recognize that there were still many things that Christ wished he could have told his disciples, but they were not ready for it. John 16. John 16, 12. I have much more to tell you, but now it would be too much for you to bear. Then, the Bible is written by inspired men, but it is not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God is, excuse me, God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put himself in, in words, in logic, in the rhetoric, on the trial in the Bible. The writer, excuse me, the writers of the Bible were God's penman, not his pen. Look at the different writers. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that, are, that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on man's words or his, ins, his expressions, but on the, man, excuse, on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. Let me interrupt there for just a moment. We'll finish it up in a moment. So what are the implications of that? Let's think about that for a moment. When, when Daniel, for example, saw a vision, he, he saw the vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw, and there's that image. That was not spelled out in words. So what does Daniel have to do? He, have to, he has to he sort it out. We, he, we, don't we don't get the picture. I mean, it would be nice if we all saw the vision. We don't do that. He has to sort it out, and he has to write it down in his own words. And... We then, ha it has to be translated, it has to be copied, da-da-da, down through the generations before it comes to us. It's amazing that the Bible is as good as it is, really. Go ahead, Jim. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that are, were inspired. Inspiration acts not on man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, has imbued him with thoughts. But the words receive the... Excuse me. But the words receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will. Thus, the utterances of man are the words of God. Manuscript, 1886. Interestingly enough, that was written by Ellen White in 
Europe while she was over there. So how many of us have spent enough time with scriptures and continue to do so on a daily basis so that we have clearly in mind the overall message of the great controversy as presented in scripture? How many people, even in the Seventh-day Adventist church, understand the great controversy? Most don't, <laughs> at least today. How many of our young people even know that there's a book called The Great Controversy? Yeah. That's the sad part. Yeah, yeah, very sad. And to understand the implications of it and the Conflict of the Ages series, the whole right. five-volume set. Yeah. Wow. And to, to, under, to see the way that was put together, just, I mean, some of you are aware, I'm sure, that uh, there were university uh, uh, heads back in Ellen White's day, who read that book and said, this is, this is the best we've ever, especially Desire of Ages. Just absolutely nothing else like it. You study that side by side with the Bible and back and forth and back and forth. It is just fantastic. Well, there are many passages in Scripture that cannot be understood without an understanding of the great controversy over God's character and form of government and Satan's attempts to misrepresent God in every way he possibly can. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand, as we read every part of Scripture, we need to say, okay, what's going on here? What, what is God trying to say to us? Who is trying to defeat God's purposes? Who's trying to confuse us and so forth like that? Another simple example of a problem that raises questions is Luke 23, 43. Carrie, I think that's yours. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's from the King James Version. Okay. So we see, we ha let's notice what it says there. Yes. Jesus said unto him, This is Jesus on the cross. And who is he talking to? One the thief. He's talking, one of the thieves is being crucified beside him. Verily I say unto thee, comma, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Comma's, so? Comma's in the wrong place. How do you know that? <laughs> Believing as we do, that's how it ought to be. <laughs> okay, but why is it like that? Why did they put it like that? Because it's in their mind. Was done. That's what they think. That yeah, exactly. Correct. Right. So, what does it say in the original? I want to think that there it no says uh, there's no comma. There there's is no there, punctuation there in the original. It, it, speaking, well, there's, there's some very simple punctuation, but there were no right, commas. Right. Yeah, yeah. None of that kind of stuff in the original. So, who wrong. puts that in there? The translators. The translators. Yes. Yeah. I've got a very quick question because if indeed they say, yeah, Jesus went straight to heaven when he died, of course, that's the prevalent uh, even now all over. But if that's so, why did they break the legs of the thieves? So, no okay. one, let's, let's, let's follow that story through quickly. Yeah. Jesus, was, Jesus died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Sundown in that part of the world is around 6. It never varies very much, but around 6. They came, of course, they buried Jesus. They took Jesus and buried him. But they broke the legs of the thieves. And why did they break their legs? So they up their walk death. away. Well, to hurry up also, their death. death. But so that they would not run away. Yeah, right. So they, they, had to, they, they, brought, they had to take them down. They couldn't have them on the cross on Sabbath. Well, when was the Sabbath start? It starts at sundown. So if Jesus really meant, given their system that you're going to be with me today in paradise, it would have to be between 3 and 6. Right? Yes. The thief, for, for sure. We don't know when the thief died. And it was probably a couple, two, three days later. But the point is, and, and there's more than that. So, it is the interp interpreters who have decided where to put the comma. The simple solution, if we were to say, stay with the King James Version, is to move the comma to after the words today. Thus, it could be, Jesus said, I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that makes sense with everything else we know from Scripture. But there are other reasons why we should choose to move that comma. Carrie, I mean, I'm sorry. Charles? Do not hang on to me, Jesus told her, Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
because I have not yet gone back unto my father. But go to my brothers and tell them, especially Thomas, uh, yeah. not, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and tell them that I am returning to him who is my father and their father, my God and their God. Okay, now let's, let's put the picture together so we see this clearly. It's now Sunday morning. We would call it Sunday morning. Wait, wait. There was the morning of the first day of the week in, in their thinking, okay? And the sequence happened something like this. The ladies started out from different directions. You know, you, Jesus has been killed as a traitor to the Roman government. You don't want to be hanging around. I mean, you don't want to be associating too closely with him for fear that they'll arrest you and, and do, do the same to you. But women generally were not... They didn't worry so much about them. And so they said, okay, they agreed on this on the Sabbath. Okay, we're going to go and we're going to figure out somehow or other to at least honor his body. On, on Friday, we still have some time. On, yeah. on, when the Sabbath was over, this is in Mark, I think, mm -hmm. these ladies did get together and yeah. prepared the spice. And yes. probably they went back to their own homes. Exactly. And then, That's right. exactly what happened. So the next morning they came from different directions. If you put the stories together, if you read the Gospels and you put it all together, you realize that Mary got there first. She came from one direction. She got there first. The tomb was empty. She did not see the angels. She just saw the tomb was empty. She raced to the disciples and said, his body is gone. Meanwhile, the other lady showed up thinking about who's going to roll the stone away from us? Who's going to, will those soldiers, will those Roman soldiers let us, or whatever soldiers are, they, are they going to let us in there to, to uh, anoint his body? They get there and same thing, gone, but not, not only that, they started to go in and there's the angel telling them, hey, why are you looking from here? He's not here. Yeah. So they start off to tell the disciples. And what happens when they tell the disciples? Well, Peter and John, well, the one that the Lord loved. So yeah. John, they run, and of course John they, outran. Mary told them the story, so now yes. they race over there. Yes, John outran Peter. He stopped. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't go into the tomb, but Peter did. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, he said, "What did the other disciples say? Ah, these women. Yeah, <laughs> they're wrought up emotionally. They, they're, they're, they're all worried about what happened. Yeah, can't believe them. Wow." Even if the usual understanding of what happens at death were true, the thief did not die that day. So he could not have been with Jesus in some, some paradise that day. And by the way, you know, the Catholics, they, you know, they clearly represent, understand that this is not the real paradise in heaven. They, they take Jesus and say, I have not yet ascended to my father. So they've created another, another paradise that Jesus goes to and stays there. And then he comes back to earth and then he goes to heaven. Well, are, are the Protestants uh, also biting on that? Uh, well, because we, the people reason with, I mean, this, they'll say, well, being absent from the body, present with the Lord. The, the show them all of this, doesn't matter, being absent, I mean, they have gone with, yeah. with the teachings of the Catholic well, Church. Well, furthermore, if heaven is what Jesus meant when he said paradise, Jesus himself said on Sunday that he had not yet ascended to his father when he was talking to Mary, when she came back. And then Jesus is there, and she thinks he's the gardener. And then he finally, he, he speaks his usual voice. Immediately she recognizes him, and she wants to grab on to him and hold him. And he said, no, I, I haven't gone Don't to my father to yet. Don't hang on to me. I, I can. I think we got time. I can yeah, read. Yeah, we have a lot of Let's, Let's read these verses. Then the Jewish authorities asked Pilate to allow them to break the bones of the men who had been crucified and to take the bodies down from the crosses. They requested this because it was Friday and they did not want the bodies to stay on the crosses on the Sabbath since the coming Sabbath was especially holy. And of course, that was Passover. So the soldiers went and broke the legs of the first man and then of the other man who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear into Jesus' side, and at once blood and water poured out. The one who saw this happen has spoken of it. Who would that be, do you think? <laughs> the beloved. Yeah. Um, 
so that you also may believe. What he said is true, and he knows that he speaks the truth. This was done to make the scripture come true. Not one of his bones will be broken. And there's another scripture that says, people will look at him whom they pierced. pierced. And then verse, chapter 20, verse 17, do not hold on to me, Jesus told her, because I have not yet gone, up to, gone back up to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am returning to him who is my father and their father, my God and their God. We already read that verse, but that's the end of the story there. Wow. If we are careless and lazy and try to brush over difficult passages in Scripture, we may develop such a habit of doing that, and therefore we may brush over large portions of Scripture. There is a story about a pastor who was trying to explain people to people what he did with difficult passages. He says, you know, dealing with difficult passages in the Bible is like eating fish. You eat the fish, but when you come to bone, you set the bone That's off to the side. <laughs> and, he, and he says, when it's all done, you have the bones all there separate. And the person says, well, what happens when you have a whole plate full of bones? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, we can't, we can't just keep piling up the bones. We need to change our thinking to agree with Scripture rather than trying to reinterpret Scripture to agree with our thinking. Some difficulties divide, defy ease, easy and quick answers. They require determination and patience. For centuries, scholars have been puzzled over one of the most perplexing discrepancies in Scripture— the disparate numbers of the reigns of the Hebrew kings in the Old Testament. The Bible provides much information about these things, but when the information is put together, it seems contradictory. The time periods as presented in Kings do not seem to fit with the time periods as presented in Chronicles. And, and the real problem is this. It says, such and such a king ruled in, king, in, in, in the northern kingdom of Israel until such and such a king came in Judah, and back and forth it would go like that, and you can't seem to fit them together. It would have been easy for Adventist scholar Edwin Thiele to accept this unsolved discrepancy as a gift, as a given. But because, and, and this is a very interesting story, because Edwin Thiele was a, a young Adventist pastor, asked to go to a place where he could get a good education. He went to the University of Chicago. Who does, who's in charge of the University of Chicago? Catholics. Catholics. Yeah. yeah. He went there and he says, I'm here because some of the best scholars in the world are here. And he studied under them. And he came to this problem. He says, there has to be a solution. There has to be a solution. So he started struggling and struggling. And he learned about the different ways that people counted days and so forth in the ancient times. And then he realized that the northern kingdom was, was using one method of, of counting years, and the other, southern king used a different method of counting years. And if you, uh, you accounted for that, you made that adjustment, the whole thing put together. And he, that, was his, that was his doctoral thesis. And now that, that, if you read any commentary, you come to this section, in First Kings, they will all quote the Adventist scholar who figured it out. Mm. All the commentaries. And I happen to know something very interesting. Um, I'm going to have to hurry here as I'm running out of time, but at the same time he was there studying in Chicago, there was another Adventist pastor. Maxwell? He, no, another German Adventist pastor who, who was married to a lady from, from Holland. And they went to, back, those, back in those days, Indonesia was considered the Dutch East Indies. Yes. And they were missionaries over there. And when the Second World War started, the police came and says, we know your wife is, is Dutch. But you're German, and considering the fact that the Germans are against us, we can't let you stay here and, and work here because you might take sides with the other side. And anyway, a long story happened, but he ended up spending the next four years sitting in, a, a, he ended up over in a prison in England, uh, not in England, in, in India, a British prison in India. That's right, it was called. And he had all of his, his books, and he sat down there, and he worked it all out, and this was Dr. Horn, who ended up being the father of America of, of Adventist uh, Siegfried archaeology, Horn. Siegfried Horn. Horn yes. And he worked out exactly the same thing that the other man worked out in the University of Chicago. Here's one in America in the university, this other guy in a prison in, in, in England, I keep India. saying English, in, in India. India, and they both worked it out almost at the same time. 
And so it's now written that his, his, his doctoral thesis is a book entitled The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings, and it's amazing. It has become a standard work that is widely recognized in scholarly circles far beyond the borders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, are we capable of setting aside our prejudices and our pet theories when we read the Bible? Where do prejudices and pet theories come from? When you're raised, probably. Background. <laughs> a lot of it comes from background, yes. where we were raised and so forth, the ideas we were taught as children. Daniel was, given, Daniel was given a vision which perplexed him and troubled him for years in Daniel 8. Finally, after an honest and lengthy period of time of praying to God, the answer was given to him. It is one of the most important passages of Scripture, and that's Daniel 9. We now, we just read through. Daniel 8 right next to Daniel 9. We, it takes us a few minutes to put the two together, and we use Daniel 9 to interpret, to, to understand Daniel 8. This 2300-day prophecy, and here's over here is this 490-year prophecy, and it, with the two are put together, and bingo, bingo, we have, the, we we solve the problems. Are we prepared to allow God to do that kind of interpretation for us, or are we going to demand that we have the answers that we want right now? And we live in a time and an age where, I mean, if you tell people they have to wait. In this country, it's almost like you're looking for trouble. You're looking for trouble. Yeah, yes. we want we want everything right now. Yeah. We want our food right now. We want shopping right now. We want everything. We want our bank. We want to have our bank accounts in in our cell phone right there, right now. I can get in for everything. It's amazing. We 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 have a terrible time with waiting, yeah. and God made Daniel wait almost ten years between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. What if we had to wait that long? Yeah. We just, we don't know what to do with waiting. We have, you, you go to some other parts of the world and okay, that's okay. We'll stand in line here. It's no problem. We're, we're, we're patient. Instant gratification. Yeah, we want instant gratification. We want, we want our answers. We want everything right now. And don't tell me to wait. You know, God give me patience and I need it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think Daniel, Daniel was probably much more patient than we are. Yeah, obviously. And he was praying about it. Think about that. Yeah. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed our, our discussion together. We really enjoyed this subject. Now we'll pray. Our kind and loving Father, these difficult passages can be a challenge. We know that there's answers, there's explanations for each of them, and your Holy Spirit can guide us to find those answers. We thank you for this opportunity we have to discuss these issues and this important series of lessons. We thank you for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.